Okay, welcome back, everybody. Um, next up, a really interesting talk here from Karen Beer, who's going to talk about bringing Zen to uh, CentOS 6, which has been uh, really one of the more interesting things that's uh, transpired in this past year. Karen Beer. Thanks. Thanks, Russell. Um, how many of you guys have used CentOS? I'm guessing a few people have, right? Okay. How many of you have started using Zen because it was in CentOS? Okay. Um, in 2007, um, something interesting happened. CentOS 5 was, was made available, you know, thanks to the work done upstream and some of the work that we did as well. But what it really did was that this is the first time there was a complete open source solution that you could use and abuse and do whatever you want to do in whichever way you want to do. You could brand it, sell it, retail it. You could use it internally. You could use it with you know, commodity storage on commodity machines to achieve stuff which otherwise in the past you'd have to pay a lot of money to a company called VMware for. This is really the first time there was a stable virtualized platform that you could just use it and it worked out of the box. Um, but the best part about the whole, about the whole you know, ecosystem that came up around Zen and CentOS 5 was the fact that the community created itself screaming, shouting, whether they wanted to, whether they didn't want to, it didn't matter. The community happened on its own. Because Zen was integrated in with the system, there was, there was no external component that you had to get in from somewhere. It was all a part of the distribution. You could install it. And the installer was smart enough to work out, hey, I'm being installed into a Zen environment. I'm being, in, I'm being installed into a PV Zen environment or a HVM Zen environment. And it would make decisions for you. It would help you do things like you know, get the right um, drive I.O. modules up and things like that. So it would do, it would do some really cool, smart stuff. Um, which meant a lot of people started using it. And then these people started blogging about it. And then these people started talking about it. And then started writing how-tos about it. And they would go to these Linux user group meetups and tell other people about the fact that, hey, I've got four computers on my computer. I've got one machine. And I can reboot any of those four at any point I want. And I can do whatever I want. It doesn't make a difference to the other machines. I, th I guess the point that I'm trying to get to is that these are people who weren't buying into virtualization because of something they read on a, you know, in a white paper in an academic setup. These were people who were really finding benefits of virtualization. Um, and you know, small ab abstract examples of this was I bumped into somebody who's a, who's a doctor in, in uh, so how many of you guys have been to India? So, so, so a couple of people have been to India and survived the experience. I'm guessing the empty chairs are the ones who didn't quite survive the experience. Um, there's a couple of things that, that, are, that are quite sort of, you know, back to basics in India and, and the medical setup, you know, the whole social government supported medical infrastructure is, is one of them. Um, and I was talking to this young doctor who is, uh, well, I say young, I'm not really that old myself, um, but youngish guy, um, who was using Zen on CentOS 5.2. And what they were doing was they were building these VMs, which would contain medical records for statistics and for models for medicines that had been proved by their state department. And they were shipping these VMs out. Um, on USB keys by post to all of the hospitals and all of the doctors who needed this information. And all those guys would do is they would get a .cfg file, they would drop it into ETC Zen, and do XM minus E create, and Bob's your uncle, and that's it. If anything failed, they had yesterday's or they had last week's image they could fall back to. This is not really classic virtualization solution, right? This is not really the kind of problem domain that the guys at Citrix were really working towards, right? Or at that point, Zen source. But it's, you know, ingenious stuff that people came up with. And then with CentOS 6, that equation changed a bit. As in, you could still do all of this stuff, but you had to use something else, which created a bit of a problem. And my talk kind of addresses more of you know, what we did, how we did it, why we did it kind of a thing, rather than the bits and bobs about it. And I hope, and I hope you guys sort of you know, get some value from that. So a, a bit about me. I'm based out of the UK. I'm based out of London. Um, I, I love the rain. I don't know why people have a problem with it. Um, it was terrible, yeah. I mean, uh, I had to shut my machines down in, in, the, in the garage, and it was getting so warm. I don't know what's up with that. I don't know why people live in places like California. It's like, you know, where do you run your servers? How do you cool your servers down? Um, I've been involved with the CentOS project for about seven years. Um, and again, because I was doing something for my employer at that point, which didn't quite work um, on any other platform. Um, and, and the amount of money that Red Hat wanted to support us was, was way, they were like, I mean, there were about four or five zeros more than we were ready to pay for it. Um, and CentOS seemed to be like a good place to be, so you know, I kind of joined the community, got involved with the thing, and, and seven years down the road, I'm still around. I love bullet points, as you'll see through my talk, uh, and, I, and I love Trappist Beer. 
I haven't quite gotten around the whole IPA infatuation in the US. What is that all about? Everybody here seems to be wanting to drink IPA. And really harsh IPA as well. I think you guys should all try Trappist Belgian beers. It's like this is a whole new world out there. So I've given you a bit of the background already that you know, CentOS 5 came out. A lot of people invested in virtualization around it to do some really interesting things. Um, I know there was there's a school project in, in Brazil which, uh, which does some stuff with virtualization as well, where they deliver classroom content using um, Zen PV domains. Um, and they ship them out. They ship out the examination content on a, on a Lux encrypted LV volume, which people can put on. And the day of the test, the teachers get a text message which has the decryption password. So th and then they kind of know that, hey, nobody else can get to this test. And the test is delivered as a, as a web app from a Zen DOM U. Which is so, so it's, it's like, I think, going back to the point, it was a lot of really creative, crazy stuff that people were doing around you know, virtualization on 5, which wasn't possible earlier. Or maybe it was possible, it just wasn't that mainline. It wasn't that mainstream. People weren't really doing like, crazy stuff with it. Um, Red Hat had um, an agenda, had a, had a um, policy, had a principle, had a, had a marketing goal of pushing intellectual property that they own, right? And, and at that point, when 6 came out, KVM was what they were doing. KVM was like the in-house kind of thing. Um, so the message that they were pushing out was that, hey, you know, we've just shipped 6. And that's fine. You know, 6 is great. And then there was, you know, lots of people thinking, well, hang on. I can't run a DOM 0 on CentOS 6 or, or RHEL 6. And, and, and the feedback or what, you know, Red Hat Marketing kind of was pushing out was, hey, but that's fine, you know? So you can still run a DOM 0 on 5. And you can run your DOMS U's on, on 6. So you can still have the goodness of 6. You can still have you know, Apache 2.2, and you can still have PHP 5.3, or whatever. And you know what's wrong with running your DOM 0 on, on 5? You carry on running it. Um, there are a few differences between the Linux kernel 2.6.8 and 2.6.32, right? Um, and one of them, one of the really, really beneficial ones is, well, well OK. Let me not, let me not, let me not uh, slack off a bunch of guys. A lot of people worked on this code, right, between 2618, 268, to 2632, and they're all really good features to have. But one really cool thing is power management about 2630 had a, had a massive rewrite. Um, and when we did some tests, and this was within our own CentOS build systems, we've got like six or seven machines, we did a few tests, and we found um, the guy who's giving us space to host those machines said that you can't use more than eight amps of electricity. And when we upgraded those machines from five, to six, we suddenly found, hey, we've got enough electricity to squeeze in another machine, which we didn't have earlier. So what's going on with that? Um, and on Dell Gen 11, Gen 12 machines, we found that the power utilization of the CentOS 6 kernel was between 8 to 12% lower than power utilization of the same workload of the CentOS 5 kernel, which is a massive benefit to have. Perhaps not so much if it's just me you know, on the laptop. But if you've got 100 machines, you can 10% you know, of your electricity bill is a good win to have. What was also happening was that a lot of tooling that was coming up, a lot of the management stuff that is coming up now is coming up around 6. Um, and 5 isn't really supported that much. Like a lot of the really cool stuff with Puppet and Chef and Foreman and Catello, all of those things are, are being driven towards 6. And you want to be able to manage your base layers with the same tooling, right? So you want 6 on there. Um, so people are trying some interesting things to work around the solutions, right? To, to work around this thing. The number one was move to Debian. Right? Hey, Debian's got Zen. Um, so seven years ago, when I got involved with the CentOS project, this is what we tried to do at my workplace as well. We said, hey, you know, we've got 150 machines running MySQL, sharded setup. We're doing some really cool stuff. It doesn't matter what we use under it, right? Let's move to Debian. It took us six hours to find the Apache configs. Because this was a group of five guys who had basically used Red Hat technologies since, I mean, my first Red Hat install was back in 96, right? I think um, 4.1 or something. Um, and it's just, you know, it had kind of worked, and then, you know, stuff kind of worked, and we knew where things were. We, we knew that whole ADCS config kind of stuff. So about three or four days down the road, the boss was, you know, so how's the Debian migration plan going on? And we were like, not very well. <laughs> this, is, this is going to need, like, you know, a, a lot more resources than we had planned for. Um, but the biggest challenge was that none of the tooling that we had in place, none of the provisioning tools that we had in place, none of the PXC configs we had in place, none of the kickstarts that we had in place, none of the MySQL tuning stuff that we had in place, None of our PHP front layers we had in place. And, and OK, I admit, I have used Visual Basic in the past. And at that point, we did have a very large Visual Basic 6 application that used to talk to this MySQL cluster of 150 machines. Even the drivers for that didn't work with Debian. 
And we were like, you know, this could be a massive rabbit hole. We have no idea, you know, what's at the other end of this, and we don't even know when we might come out of it. And I think a lot of people who tried to do this, including some of the really large hosting companies who tried to go the Debian route, found that, hey, with the investment that they already had with Zen on 5, on Zen 5, it wasn't really going to work out moving to Debian. They would have to either rethink the entire architecture or move to KVM. And they're like, look, we've done the Zen thing for a while. We see the wins. Um, at this point, Zen was also about seven years mature, six or seven years into the maturity cycle. KVM was about maybe two and a half years. Uh, to a point, I think, where Red Hat had only started supporting it in production about a year, year and a half before this point. A lot of the things that you could do with Zen, a lot of things that people were already doing with Zen, you couldn't really do with KVM, so you had to come up with workarounds. So that plan didn't work out very well, and you still needed new tools, because when Zen shipped with Five, everybody invested on XM, everybody invested in scraping XM, everybody invested in writing their own little API layers, because all developers love doing that, right? If you get five developers into a room, they'll come up with 14 APIs. And the next day, they would have re-engineered three of them. Um, and all of those APIs were using XM. We did, we did a little spike thing where, where I went around and spoke to a lot of people at hosting conferences. So, you know, what virtualization do you use on CentOS like Zen? OK, so how do you, how do you actually you know, interface with Zen? Yeah, XM. But do you really use XM? No, I've got these bash scripts, which call XM. And then we scrape what comes out, and we do stuff here. So again, KVM was going to be completely new tooling. Even if you were using Libvirt, it was going to mean complete uh, new tooling, and then the way you provision and what you provision was going to change, right? So that, both of the steps weren't really working out very well. So what we did in the, within the project was we said, hey, okay, let's pull in our resources. We have a bunch of smart people, ish people. Um, what can we do? And then the first thing that a lot of people within the CentOS project assume everybody knows, and a lot of people don't really realize, is that the CentOS project is an independent entity from the CentOS Linux distribution. As in the CentOS project are the bunch of guys who create the CentOS Linux distribution. They're also the people who do things like forum support, mailing lists, IRC, help out in bugs, help out with code, extend the system, all that kind of stuff. But the core values, the core principles of what we do within CentOS is that we don't promote CentOS as a platform. We promote what people do with CentOS, right? So, so, it's, a, so it's a user focused stuff. Uh, so it's a completely user focused uh, ecosystem. Also, we're not developer and feature led. The entire platform, the entire CentOS project moves based on user expectations and problem domains. We're not looking to build new features. So if you've, got, if, you, if you've got a little app that needs yesterday's version of libcurl and tomorrow's version of libyaml and you know, the libxml42 that's coming out in six days' time, then CentOS is really not the platform that you want to be using. You know, there's, there's a lot of other people who try and solve that problem. But if you want something you can deploy today that's still going to be here three years from now, then hey, think about CentOS. It's, a, it's, it's quite a viable platform for that kind of a workload, which is why it also makes fantastic um, hypervisor platforms. And our entire cloud strategy from the project side has been that, hey, you know, you want to run the cloud? Excellent. Everybody wants to run the cloud. You want to run VMs, Ubuntu, Windows, whatever you want to do, you know, instances, fine. But when it comes down to considering your hypervisor platform, consider CentOS. Install it today. Five years from now, it's still doing what it's supposed to be doing. So the problem we had was that we don't really have the developer depth that was required to make this happen. So we started talking to um, Lars and, and David Nelly. Um, and saying, hey, you know, what, what can we kind of do? Um, so we had a couple of initial meetings with the Citrix guys. We had a couple of meetings with people we thought represented the best user base. Um, and we brought in a bunch of people. We said, you know, who are the ideal candidates that we would want to target? Who are the people who represent the workloads that we really want to go for? Um, and obviously, right up on top of the list was me. I was like, hey, I want to solve my problems. And then everybody else who was privy to this conversation said, you know, I have you know, a corner, I have a niche, I have a, you know, like my own corner case, and I want to bring that to the table. So we kind of spoke about that a little bit. We did, you know, make, make installs. We tried to build a few things, see how the patches could work. Um, we did something like take 4.1 at the time, Zen 4.1, and try to apply it to the last 15 CentOS 6 kernels. And we're like, hey, this is not going to work out. So we did, we did a few things, and we came up with a set of core targets that we wanted to hit. We said it has to be Zen 4 based, because that's what everybody really wants to be on right now. It has to have a stable kernel. We can't get into a situation where we're building yesterday's LTS or we're building you know, yesterday's mainline. Um, and at this point, we'd also said that 2.6.32 isn't really going to work out, especially with the Red Hat patch set. It was going to be too much of an effort getting Zen 4 back in. So that has to go. Um, and then from the user side, we wanted to preserve its existing infrastructure. So we wanted kickstarts that worked on 5 to still work. We wanted like spacewalk satellite installs to still be able to consume it. We wanted people to be able to install CentOS the way they install CentOS and then consume Zen on top of it. 
Um, and you wanted to target the needs of the existing Zen users. You're like, hey, you know, Zen is doing great stuff in feature terms, in terms of, you know. So I think to this particular audience, I don't have to sell Zen, right? I think everybody's kind of bought into it. Um, but what we really wanted to do was not get into a point where it was feature-led. We didn't want to get into a point where, you know, we were building and releasing every Zen release all the time and then expecting all of the users to hit the upgrade um, treadmill, as it were. We wanted to get something which is kind of, you know, going to stay stable. Um, and the process we adopted was this thing that we've started doing in CentOS now. And it has, it has, it has, it's a double-edged sword. I know some people in the communities aren't very keen on, on us doing this sort of thing and why we do it. But what we really do is we try and get people who represent the user base, people who represent the problem domain on a private mailing list. We try and find the people who can help them solve those problems on, on the same private mailing list. And then we try and build CentOS infrastructure around it. Because what happens is that there's an expectation in the user base around CentOS branded code going out. And even though you know you can have like blink flashing red lights around it that you know this is dev code, do not use this, people will still use it. Right? Um, and doing this basically meant that we could build the process, we could build the code, we could get to a point where we knew we could actually ship something before getting into a situation where you know, 500 people are using it and we have to then sort of try to call them up by saying, look, you're going to have to uninstall this or your machine's going to get hacked because we're not supporting this anymore. Right? And if, if 500 people are using it, three people will have, ever get in touch with you. The 497 other silent majority, you'll never have any contact with. So we started using this process and I think it, it worked out really well um, for, for what we were trying to do here. So we said, okay, 2632 isn't going to work, so we're going to branch onto 3.4 LTS. Uh, the mainline LTS kernel for, for the time being. We'll try and get to a two-year production cycle, which is what, you know, based on user feedback, that, that was good enough. That's what people were really looking for. People didn't want the five, 11 year cycle for, for, for this particular solution. They were like, two years is good enough. Ensure that during those two years, all upgrades are in place. So we test for those updates. Um, and we'll build every even generally. So we'll do, we did 4.2, we'll do 4.4. We're not actually doing 4.3, unless somebody at Citrix, you know, picks up the phone and says, you know, whoa, we've got a massive security issue we're going to have to do this. So the aim is that you're only going to build even updates and, and, and work with that. Um, the kernel is basically the bog standard LTS 3.4 with a few Zen specific patches, including um, the BlockTap 2.5. How many people know BlockTap 2.5? How many people know what that? How many people, I didn't, so I didn't know there was something called BlockTap 2.5. I knew there was one, there was two, and there was going to be a three. And then turns out there was a 2.5 as well, which some of the people said it's critical for them to be able to move to this platform, and, and the Citrix guys actually put in the effort to, to get this going on that kernel. Um, from the Zen side, we wanted to make sure um, we wanted to make sure that we don't fragment the communities. Whatever we were shipping, we wanted those guys to be able to go back to the Zen.org or the ZenProject.org infrastructure and actually talk to people there. Unlike, let's say Samba, for example, like the Samba shipped in CentOS is about you know two and a half, three years adrift from from mainline. So you go to the Samba communities and say, hey, I've got a problem with this. The first response you get is, you need to install the latest release. And we wanted to not get into that situation with Zen. So what we've tried to do is we try and promote as much as possible um, the communities to come up around the Zen project rather than the Zen communities coming up around the CentOS project and then fragmenting it. Um, the ongoing plan, I think we've, we've touched on this already, is you know, deliver Zen for even releases, do a two-year thing. Um, and, del and deliver and maintain the ecosystem around Zen CentOS rather than around CentOS with a bunch of people who use, who use Zen. Um, our primary user testing was a hosting company you may have heard of. Uh, is there anybody here who hasn't heard of them? No, somebody here, okay. Uh, our second big user case was the guys who were helping us doing the trench work was another hosting company that some of you may have heard of, um, and which was, which was a two large hosting services company with about 180,000 clients. One of those two, without going into names, had a 30,000 hypervisor cluster that they actually deployed this on and tested as well. So we knew that it actually works. Um, we had, and, and there were a couple of small vendors as well. There were a couple of people who built solutions around Zen, and they kind of came along and said, you know, how can we get involved? And I think when we released, we had about 80 odd people representing different interest groups who were involved in the, in the test release process. Um, our biggest challenge has been engaging the users. And uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a bit of a numbers thing at the end, uh, which I think people will find amusing as well. But what, what we've kind of realized is that we're hitting about a 1.8 to 1.9% 1 hit rate in engaging users. So for every 100 users out there, there's a 1.5 person who actually talks to us. Which is, 
a bit of an interesting or an awkward position to be in because what's happening now is that the people who worked with us within the, within the keyway release process, um, even a lot of them have now gone away and done a little bit of work around the edges, which, which isn't really being fed back in, and that's a massive challenge. Um, and we're using what people would normally do in the communities to address that. If anybody has bright ideas, if anybody has you know, uh, comments on how we can fix that, please come and find me. Um, the, the other problem has been engaging vendors and providers. A lot of people have started building and developing solutions around the Zen for CentOS stack. It would be nice if some of them actually came and spoke to us, because some of them, including small you know, one-man, two-man, three-man companies all over the world, are building stuff which is otherwise open source. And we've actually got a process in place that allows them to release the code into the CentOS ecosystem, giving them access to a massive user base. But how do we actually reach out and how do we get them in through that door has proven to be a massive issue. So again, if anybody has ideas, if anybody has views on how we can help solve that, please come and find me. I would love to, I would love to have you know, um, a better ecosystem that helps people succeed around, around Zen for CentOS. Um, in terms of future plans, we're looking to expand scope. We've got Ceph and ClusterFS coming in by the end of this month. Um, and that's specific to the functionality needed within the Zen 4 stack as used by CloudStack and OpenStack. So this is not, so this is not Ceph and ClusterFS going into generic CentOS repositories. This is Ceph and ClusterFS going into um, targeting. So at, one of the, uh, at the previous, the dojo before last, David Scott from Citrix did a talk on, um, on OpenStack running with Zen for CentOS, uh, Zappi, and Ceph. Uh, and there's a video of this online on the CentOS Project uh, YouTube channel. I think about 1,500, 1,600 people have seen that video. I highly recommend everybody goes and see it. In about 20 minutes, he got the entire cloud stack stuff up and in a stage where he could scale it with the whole stack, which is, which is, which is a really good place to be. So Ceph and Glusterf has actually targeted that particular platform. Um, what we're also trying to do is Eucalyptus and Open Nebula are both kind of community-driven cloud controllers. I'm, I'm sure most people would have heard of at least one of the two. But both of them dropped the ball a little bit on Zen support. And we're trying to engage with both of those communities, or both of the developer communities, to try and bring support for Zen for CentOS back in. I think the Open Nebula guys showed up at the, was it the Google-hosted Zen Hackathon? And I think they've actually put in, the code has gone in, and the new release has support for Zen for CentOS. Um, I'm working quite hard on the Eucalyptus guys to try and get them to do, do this as well, because they've kind of bridged over to only supporting KVM. Um, and, and we're trying to facilitate, we're trying to kind of get resources going so they can start uh, checking this as well. Um, we've got an ISO which is ready to go. We didn't release it with 6.4, but we're going to release it with 6.5, which is pre-booted, pre-loaded with Zen. So it's a CentOS installer which has the Zen code built in. Plug it in, boot up your machine, and it'll give you a Zen first uh, install on it. Um, I think James touched on the fact that we're trying to get Zappy in. Most of the work has been done, but we hit a roadblock in, I think, people changed, environment changed, a lot of other stuff happened, so we quite, I'm quite keen on sort of rebooting that effort and getting it in before 6.5 comes along. Um, then the other thing, the final point in here is that we ship a custom version of libword into the Zen for CentOS repositories, which is a different version of libword from the generic CentOS 6 KVM libword. And that's because we're supporting XM and XL. And we also have the patches in for getting Zappy in through libword in the version shipped with Zen for CentOS. Um, and Red Hat hasn't, made, hasn't accepted those patches in yet. So the, the libword that's in there is better than the libword that you can get in Fedora or Debian at the moment, in that everything works, including Somebody's going to probably kill me for saying this, but I do know that Spice kind of works as well. Sometimes on Mondays when your machine is facing north, but it does it. So, I mean, the support for the whole thing is there, and XM and XL work out of the box. And you can do remote management, and you can integrate it with any libbird uh, script and stuff. Okay, I've lost something, maybe. Hang on, let's see if this works. So, let's see. A little bit of a story of numbers, right? Um, CentOS 5 was released quarter one, 2007. A lot of people enjoyed it, much festivities around it. You know, Zen works, people came up with some interesting things. Hosting, VoIP, HPC, and in embedded uh, areas were what, what I think, based on what, you know, digging around I've been able to do, were the biggest adopters for Zen on CentOS. Um, and all industries which were traditionally either not looking at virtualization at all, or were looking at massive, you know, vendor lock-in kind of solutions. So it, was, it, it went well for many, many years. And I think, I'm not, I don't have the number up there, but off the back of my head, I remember that at one point we were greater than 1.6 to 1.7 million installs where people were using CentOS 5 with Zen at various points. But in, in the first week of Jan this year, I, did a, I actually went through um, an exercise for a couple of days and tried to come up with a number. 
that hey, are we actually solving this, this problem for me myself? Or is there really somebody else out there just like me who's got exactly the problems that I do? And it was kind of important that if you're going to commit resources, you know, we do it to something which is worthwhile. Because there's so many things you could do. Let's find something which is worthwhile. And the worthwhile was that we came up with a number which we kind of extrapolated a little bit around. And we said 750,000 estimated installs out there. In January this year, we're running Zen 3 on CentOS 5, which is a big number. Which was like, that, that, that'd be a really good problem to solve for these guys. Um, on June 20th, we released it. And kind of quietly, there hasn't been a lot of fanfare around it because we've let it grow organically. And I think the plan was that by the time we get around to having more support from the Zen project side of things, when things like you know Zen server becomes a yum install and things, then we'll start making a lot more noise about it, you know, and things like that. But September the 10th, I did, I went through the same exercise that I had gone through in early Jan this year, and the number of unique IPs that were tracking those repositories. So this is not drive-by hits; these are people who are actually hitting yum against the Zen for CentOS repositories. It was about 87,000. I'm not sure how many people will be surprised by this, but it was 98.3 or something like that IPv4, and there was like you know, the four guys who use IPv6. All of them were using this repository. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to kind of um, finish off. Uh, I don't know how we're doing for time. Join the fun. There's a, there's a wiki page that gives you all of the details. I'll make sure this presentation thing gets posted as well. I know a lot of people are going to be looking at the numbers thing to tweet around, which should be fun. Um, the, the effort is completely run off the CentOS vert list. Join in the fund. The, the Git repositories are public. The Git repositories are available to anybody and everybody who wants to use them. Um, we're going to try and push them out to GitHub so that people can fork and do their own thing. The um, workflow that we're trying to set up around the Zappy RPMs is going to be on GitHub. So go to github.com slash CentOS slash whatever the Zappy stuff is going to be. It's not there yet, but that's what we're trying to get to. Um, build system access, community access, all of that stuff is available. It's in place. Look at the wiki page. You should get you should get basically all of the bootstrap information you need. Thanks, of course, to everybody, including a, a big thanks to the Citrix guys, who at that point weren't really sold on what they were doing with open source. Or maybe they were. They just weren't admitting what they were doing. This was last year in November, December. Um, a, a big thanks to them for actually reaching out. Because the big problem we had, the roadblock that we had, was we did not have the developer depth <laughs> to do things like, hey, can I get blocked at 2.5 over into the kernel? I actually had a go at it for about three days later. I was like, look, this is going to need to be somebody who's looked at this code before, <laughs> who knows what the hell's going on. So, and it was, it, was, it was really good of them to kind of reach out um, and help us out with that sort of stuff. Also, one of the things that is key, and I haven't put it up on, this, on the slides there, is the kernel that we ship, the 3.4 kernel that we ship, is actually curated by a bunch of people. And in that bunch of people include kernel engineers at Zen Project. So if you look at the change log, you'll see guys at citrix.com doing commits as well. So should you trust that kernel? I think you should. You should trust it because it's a mainline. It's an LTS mainline, so you know what's happening. If the security fixes happening upstream, they're coming through. If the Zen-specific stuff, the Citrix guys are pushing that through. I am kind of hopeful. I don't know if this is going to happen or not. I am kind of hopeful that in future Zen server products, they actually end up using the same kernel, which makes our life a lot easier because we can just use those sources then. So the, the the, the plan, and I know Johnny's working on this, uh, he's done a spike as well, is that we want to start rebasing 3.4 to 3.10, sort of Feb, March next year. Because there's a couple of, one of the big reasons why I'm quite keen on still pushing Zen, even though a lot of people keep saying, hey, you know, when KVM works, why are you kind of wasting your time? It is something like what Larry touched on, that Zen, because of the way it is, and because of what it does, and because of the way that it runs kind of above the Linux kernel, it lends itself better to the whole disruptive hardware situation that we're in at the moment. So even on the Intel platform, people are engineering around what is sort of established conventional engineering practices. And in many of those situations, in many of those problem domains, then just fits in as a better hypervisor than KVM does. So for example, you've got a MIPS-based uh, um, network switch. You want to drop OBS on it. You don't want you know, Nortel's software on it. Or, or Nortel is fine. How about you know something from Bay Networks from like 1932? Um, <laughs> So you know you have the option of actually dropping in as an hypervisor and being able to do a bunch of this sort of stuff. Um, I'm not sure if this was NDA or not, but I haven't signed the NDA, so I'm fine with that. Um, ARM, of course, is big, and that's that's coming through. And we're trying to bootstrap ARM on a uh, for CentOS purely because we want to deliver Zen with the CentOS solution, because we think the Fedora guys, Red Hat guys, are going to do whatever they do with ARM anyway. But what we want to be able to do is deliver that hypervisor there, because we think. When you get to situations like you know 288 cores in a single box, but each core has limited processing capability. Each core can only hit 1.4 gigahertz and can't do 
you know, context switching becomes a bit of a challenge. It's nice to have the Zen wins on some of those platforms as well. Um, a couple of links if anybody's interested. Um, my email address is on there. If anybody wants this T-shirt, which I think has got the um, the vintage logo, let's not say the old logo, the, the vintage logo of, of the Zen project, send me an email, send me an email with your address, and I'll make sure, and, and your size. Um, and yeah, so American sizes, please. And I'll, I'll make sure I send something out to you. Um, so the last slide I've got before I wind up is, um, I started the whole talk with, you know, that the primary focus of what we were trying to do was solve the problem that a whole bunch of people out there, a whole bunch of hosting companies out there were running Zen on five, right? So one of the key issues that we, you know, we wanted to hit was, hey, how can we just you know, get to a point where a guy puts in a USB key and reboots the machine, and six minutes later he's running CentOS 6, and all of his VMs are still there, all of his storage is still there. It was, it was a good dream to have. Um, and, we, and we tried quite hard to make that happen, but it is tricky because, because of the number of changes and because of the way so one of the wins that people had with the XCP platform was that because the kernel is different and because access to that domain is controlled by Citrix, very few people go in there to install, for example, Oracle DB, right? Um, whereas on CentOS 5, because it's native, because it's already there, um, so, the, so we had three guys who said they would really love to help out with this testing stuff. One guy had an Oracle database running on his DOM0. And you're like, well, hang on, what are you, you know? <laughs> is, 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 that, is that a good idea? Um, and he did set up a, a dev instance of his platform, and he did go through a couple of iterations of trying to do the migration script. It wasn't going to happen. It wasn't pretty. It wasn't going to happen. Um, one of the other guys had this high-performance MySQL stack on there. And, and somebody else was running his DRBD stack on the DOM0, which is, which is not really a, a corner case. It's, 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 you know, a lot of people would want to run like cluster LVM on D DRBD or something and use that as the storage that they expose to the DOM use. And we found that you know, just the migration from DRBD 8.1 to 8.4 was, was painful. And you had to synchronize it in a way where you would have to bring the cluster down anyway. So then it was a case of what can we do and what is the best way that we can make this happen. So we have a migration script which will take a CentOS 5 machine and you will end up with a CentOS 6 machine. And it does some crazy things like non distro content will get rsynced away to slash opt slash deprecated. So if you've installed with stuff with make, make, install, it'll find all of the bits that are not managed, that didn't come from RPMs, tarball all of that stuff up, and leave it for you to handle later, which effectively means your machine may not boot. If you're running, for example, if you've been so-called PKI certified by certain co large companies wh whose names don't need to be brought up, and they've done make, make, install, open SSH installs, because that hits the right version numbers, you may end up with a machine that doesn't boot. Hopefully not a lot of people have done that kind of thing. Uh, but it, it's something to look at. It's something to consider. It goes through three reboots because it does. It changes stuff at different points. And during that, during those three reboots, everything on your machine will will be down. Um, the general line that the project toes is that if you can't find that script on your own, then you shouldn't be using that script um, because it will cause damage. It, you know, and it's not the kind of thing like you know, cPanel. Hey, I can just go in there, type in a command, and I end up with cPanel. That's not how this works. And because of the fact that it's intrusive and because of the fact we say that you know, there's a good chance your machine's not going to come back up, we don't link to that script anyway. We don't talk about that script anyway. Like, if you can find the script, which means there's a good chance, it's, it's in a Git repository and, and not a very hard place to find. Um, but if, if this is a problem that you guys want to look at, then, then there's an option. But what we say is, hey, migrate your VMs instead. Just if you've got 10 machines, take one out, install 10 sticks on it, migrate your VMs, and then cascade down and just do that loop. And I think most people would be familiar with that process, right? We haven't tested live migration from, let me, okay, let me rephrase that. We have tested live migration from three to four, but because this is not something that Zen project supports, we usually say that we haven't tested it. Um, in certain cases, if you're just using some very basic stuff, if you're using file-backed stuff and just raw storage or VHD files, it does kind of work. Um, but I believe that the official line is that you know don't do live migration is not probably going to work. So just offline it, and it should go through. So is there anything anybody wants to talk about? Any questions that anybody has, or would anybody like to know anything about Zen on CentOS or about CentOS or about Zen? I did have a really nice demo where I had a I have I actually have, hopefully I still have. Nobody's run away with that machine. I have a machine which has about half a terabyte of RAM, and. Uh, 
Um, one of the things that, that's really cool, and I've done this in the past, is bringing up 1,000 VMs on Zen. In about, it takes about 18 minutes for all of them to come up, because you know, Malik takes time when you've got that much of memory. Um, and then DHCP takes time when you've got that much of memory. And so, um, and because I believe we didn't have time, I haven't done that. Also, when I was sitting here in the morning and I was looking around at who's here, I was like, maybe bringing up VMs isn't going to be a very interesting thing to see, right? So I think most people have done that already. So kind of cycle that out. But is there anything else anybody wants to talk about? Yeah. I was curious if you had uh, like a best practices for optimal performance, like you know how much memory f per VM or what to put on your DOM U uh, DOM zero. Um, you know uh, how many CPUs to put f on each in, VM, uh, and um, I'm, I'm, I must be really growing old. I can't remember the day. But in uh, March this year, Roger Bao, who works with Citrix, did a talk at the CentOS Dojo in Antwerp, which is recorded. There's a video of that available on the CentOS Project YouTube channel, and his slides are available, where he did 45 minutes on how to performance tune Zen for CentOS. And Excellent. he went into exactly all of these things. He went into things like, you know, how do you, how do you solve the NUMA problem? Yes. How do you get your storage stuff sorted out? How can you boot in various places? What, you know? So even things like everybody seems to have this real big infatuation for QCOW, especially compressed QCOW. But it's really interesting to see under real workloads what happens to the back end with that. Even things like if you're running PV stuff on Zen 4, you still need QEMU instances running in your DOM0 for some of the, some of the backing stores. So what impact those have and how to manage memory in your DOM0. He's covered all of that stuff really well. And I won't even start going into some of the things. OK, I, that's exactly what I would like to get a hold of. If you drop me an email, I'm happy to send you a link to his talk. The, the video is there. Um, and his slides are available as well. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's a fantastic talk. I, just, I, yeah, I don't even want to kind of go in there. And if you really want to kind of get the holistic experience, um, two sessions after him was Jaime Mellis from the Open Nebula project doing uh, best practices of KVM-based uh, VMs in a cloud environment, which is also quite interesting because a lot of stuff they were talking about was, was common. And a lot of the things that one guy brought up is, are also relevant to the other setup. And what the other setup brought up was also relevant to the other setup. I think both of those talks are, are worth uh, looking at uh, in sync. And it's about two hours of your life. I, th I highly recommend it. Thank you. All right. Well, let's thank uh, Karen Beer for this wonderful talk. Huh? Thank you.